Good morning, everyone. Good morning, everyone, and uh, thank you, Jaime, for that scripture reading. Nothing says it's the Sunday after Easter, quite like the story of Jezebel trying to kill Ahab. In fact, I was, as he was reading that, thought that we could mine a new little catchphrase for uh, the invitation song out of that uh, passage that he read for us there from 1 Kings 19. Instead of, as we stand and sing, we might as well say, arise and eat. Yeah, thank you for the two of you that chuckled at that joke. I appreciate it. And for the rest of you, good morning, welcome, glad that you're here. Uh, I have the tremendous honor of getting to uh, share some good news with you this morning. Uh, in fact, Geraldine Bohannon came up to me right before worship, and she made a beeline for me. And uh, if you're a preacher on Sunday morning, and uh, one of your congregants comes to you first thing, making a beeline for you, uh, she looked like, back when I was a running back in high school, she looked like an outside linebacker ready to make a tackle. I thought I was in trouble, something I'd have said last week. In the, anyway, it was not about me. In fact, it was good news uh, that Elena Polk has been baptized. Last Sunday, uh, Elena was baptized. Let's congratulate Elena. I was really happy to get to share some good news with you all this morning. In fact, it fits perfectly with, with how I wanted to begin the sermon, which is that, that Easter for us really feels like a spiritual high point, doesn't it? It feels like uh, summiting the mountain every year as a church, doesn't it? And we build up to it, uh, Paul and I, typically in our preaching for the weeks leading up to Easter, try to prepare our minds for Easter. We, we then celebrate in our worship together the victory that we have over death in Jesus. In fact, I got more good feedback about the sermon that I had one-fourth of a part in last week than on most sermons that I preach most Sundays. I don't know what that uh, says about my preaching, but I'd like to think it means that Andy and Kennedy and Paul did a phenomenal job, and I was just along for the ride. In fact, uh, we had over 300 people here. It was such a wonderful celebratory Sunday, and then came Monday, and you should have seen us as an office staff dragging ourselves around the church building a Monday and Tuesday, because after summiting the mountain, you then have to come down off the mountain. Of course, uh, for many of us, it feels like even though the resurrection is central to our faith, there's this crash after Easter. In fact, uh, Easter is a spiritual high point for us. It feels like summoning the mountain. It, it really reminds me of my years growing up in the youth group. Uh, for those of you in the youth group, perhaps it's like this for you, uh, where you have these different moments throughout the year uh, where the youth minister tries to build these very special experiences for you throughout the year to lead you closer into relationship with Christ. For me, it was things like church camp every year. It felt like I was just living on top of the mountain. So easy to see what God wanted from my life. Surrounded by Christian friends where we could worship God and go swimming. I mean, is there, is there anything better than that? Of course, uh, so much fun it, it, to feel like I'm going to get back in the world and I'm going to be so much of a better Christian, and then Monday comes. Are you with me? Anybody ever had this kind of an experience? Uh, perhaps it's a big youth rally like Christ Teens. And then we went back to school, and it was when the teacher passed out the first homework assignment on Monday that we realized that we're not at church camp anymore. In fact, we ourselves leave Easter only to go back to work on Monday, back into the daily grind, the Monday to Friday morning routine, a routine that, let's face it, just isn't always exciting on a day-to-day -day basis. You could call this the day after the big day, or after the party, or perhaps we could label it as quote-unquote spiritual whiplash. That is something that's so great and exciting, and then, well, back to church, things go back to normal. In fact, Paul, I was talking with him on Monday, said that in the lectionary, which is an assigned reading calendar that many mainline churches use, we ourselves consult it periodically um, for preaching and teaching. Uh, Paul uh, reminded me that after Easter, the lectionary defaults back to what it calls, quote-unquote, ordinary time. And I don't know if there is perhaps more of a deflating label that we could give to a day-to-day -day existence in the church than just calling it ordinary time. We all deal with this in our spiritual lives, don't we? 
whether it's Easter for you or perhaps it's something else. We have these high points in our walk with God, times when it feels like the presence of God is palpable, tangible. You know that God is right there with you as if his hand is on your shoulder, those moments in life where you're so so assured of his existence, his, his, existence his, his power and his presence in your life. And then there are, of course, other times when you wonder where he is. There's times when it feels like everything's going our way, times when we pray and God answers our prayer. And you get those little chill bumps on your arm or the back of your neck, and you know that he's just, he's right there with you. You pray for something and God answers that prayer. And Perhaps our, our baptisms, just like Elena's, are a good example of this. This is a, a spiritual high point for you, Elena. You'll look back on this the rest of your life, and you'll say, I felt like I could do no wrong, and I was living on top of the world. I hate to break it to you. That will eventually come to an end. You'll get into ordinary time when you one day, hopefully this never happens, but perhaps we'll wake up one day and say, I don't want to go to church today. Uh, of course, with a great-grandmother like Geraldine, you'll never be allowed to miss. Uh, nevertheless, we all go through these, these peaks and valleys in our walk with God, don't we? Perhaps it's the birth of a child. Oh, and we see God's goodness, unadulterated and unfiltered, of course, until the first time you're up all night with said child. Or perhaps it's when we get to participate in something that's bigger than ourselves in the life of a church. For the volunteers in our children's ministry, maybe it's VBS every summer when we see the kids come and they have fun and, and they're loving and they're learning. And then, oh, do we crash afterward. Would now be a good time to mention that uh, we have a VBS meeting today after worship in the wilds. And we'd love any volunteers who might want to donate their time because you will feel that spiritual summit of having participated in helping these kids learn more about Jesus. But let's face it, not every day is a mountaintop experience. And brothers and sisters, I would argue that not every day should be. If every Sunday was Easter, that would be unsustainable. Of course, we live in the, the light of the resurrection, absolutely. We gather on the first day of the week because of the resurrection, and yet some Sundays just feel like Sunday, don't we? Sometimes the sermon feels like, let's face it, a base hit. Nevertheless, hey, did I hear an amen? I don't need to hear any of those. Okay, let's face it. Not every day is a mountaintop experience. So the question then is, what does it look like to be faithful in between those summit experiences? Not just faithfulness on the mountaintops. That's easy when you can look out and see God's grandeur. It's a lot harder, isn't it, to be faithful when you're down in the shadow of the valley? See, it's easy to praise God when you're on top of the mountain. What does it look like then to be faithful in the valleys of life? Brothers and sisters, there is a phenomenal example of this in 1 Kings 19, the passage that, that Jaime was prefacing for us just a moment ago, that is, after what Elijah has experienced in 1 Kings 18, then comes the valley of 1 Kings 19. In 1 Kings 18, it is one of, for my money, one of the most spectacular, awe-inspiring chapters of the Bible that will get you to jump off your feet when you see the, the miracles that God performed on Mount Carmel before the prophets of Baal in 1 Kings 18 to show once and for all that Baal was as bogus as it gets in spectacular fashion. It doesn't always happen this spectacularly in the Bible, but it did there. And so we read that, and we're inspired, and we get the goosebumps, and then we, like Elijah, experience the next day, the next chapter. Because as Jaime read for us a moment ago, what we found was when Jezebel heard about it, she was mad, and she sent men to murder Elijah. He's a prophet on the run, and he's got a gripe with God because of it. He says, I don't even know if it was worth it to have done something so spectacular for you, God, if now this is what I have to show for it. You ever been there in your life? I know that I have. There was no actual fire and chariots and men with swords chasing me, but it was metaphorically. I felt like it. What about you? We feel like it sometimes, like Elijah in 1 Kings 19, and he pulls no punches, does he? 1 Kings 19 we learn, of course, in verse 3 that he was afraid, and then when he speaks up in verse 4, he says this, 
It is enough now, O Lord. Take away my life. Brothers and sisters, for lack of a better phrase, let's be honest. Elijah has gone from the summit of the mountain, beholding the miracles of God. And right in the aftermath, brothers and sisters, he's suicidal. That's how serious this is. This depression that has come hot off the heels of this spectacular experience is deep. And it's real. You see, there's this Mount Carmel conflict in chapter 18. He's afraid. He runs for his life in chapter 19. And first of all, God knows, well, this is what you ought to do when you're in this kind of a situation is first of all, have a snack. You might just want to eat something. That's always good advice, isn't it? If you find yourself feeling like an Eeyore, start with a snack. Would you do that? It's right there in the Bible. Arise and eat, okay? But that's not the only solution. That's not where the story ends. Elijah doesn't say the prayer for the food, eat his bread and say, thank you, Lord, I'm all better. Let's go back to work. That's not the way the story goes. He did have to eat. God then sent him somewhere safe. He provided not just nourishment, but protection. God knew that Elijah needed safety. God provided that safety for Elijah, but it wasn't easy in getting there. You'll notice this journey that God takes Elijah on. In fact, he tells him to go from Mount Carmel, which is where the events of chapter 18 happen. Then to chapter 19, he goes to Mount Hebron, which is about seven miles away from Mount Carmel. When Elijah is deeply depressed, running for his life, God sends him on a seven-mile journey for safety. God knows that he doesn't have the strength for that, so he supplies him with the nourishment that is necessary in order to get there. You'll notice that God didn't give Elijah what Elijah asked for, which was a quick relief and end to his suffering. What he did give him was a snack and a road trip. He then sends him to safety. Snack, a shelter, and more, but we'll get there in a moment. But he had to wait. In fact, we learned that this is a 40-day journey to Horeb that he takes. Of course, he's doing it all on foot and on the run. A 40-day journey. See, God's answer was not a quick fix. He had to wait in order to receive God's answer to his problem. And this leads us into the text that we're going to take a look at this morning. First Kings chapter 19. I'm going to pick up reading in verse 9. First Kings 19 and verse 9. God's word says this, therefore there he came to a cave and lodged in it. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him and he said to him, what are you doing here, Elijah? And he said, I have been very jealous for the Lord, the God of hosts, for the people of Israel have forsaken your covenant, thrown down your altars, and killed your prophets with the sword, and I, even I only, am left. And they seek out my life to take it away. And he said, go out and stand on the mount before the Lord. And behold, the Lord passed by. And a great and strong wind tore the mountains and broke in pieces the rocks before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, an earthquake. You know how the story goes, right? But the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, a fire. But the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, the sound of a low whisper. And when Elijah heard it, he wrapped his face in his cloak and went out and stood at the entrance of the cave. And behold, there came to him a voice and said, what are you doing here, Elijah? And he said, I have been very jealous for the Lord, the God of hosts, for the people of Israel have forsaken your covenant, thrown down your altars, killed your prophets with the sword, and even I, I only am left, and they seek my life to take it away. And that's where we're going to put a pin in this for just a second, because this is where God finally gives him the answer that Elijah needs. This is one of the most remarkable, beautiful stories in the entire Bible. I just love it, don't you? I mean, this is just the stuff that makes a person want to be a preacher. The the, the sermon just jumps off the page. 
I love it. And we're familiar with this story. You, of course, know the progression of what happens here. The progression from the whirlwind to the earthquake to the fire, only to realize that God isn't in the flashy and in the spectacular, but the small, still voice. A a Hebrew word that, of course, could be translated as something so quiet it's barely even an audible whisper. You might even could say that God was present in the silence, not the whirlwind. Not the earthquake, not the fire. In other words, brothers and sisters, we could put it into these terms that God is not just present on the big days when his presence is tangible and evident and spectacular, but that God is present in the downtime. In all the small things, God is present. Not just on Easter but on the Monday after Easter, on the Monday after you've lost the job, God is present. You see, there's a huge valley between Mount Carmel and Mount Hebron. Mount Carmel, where Elijah witnessed the miracles of God, and Mount Hebron, where Elijah needs God to get him back on his feet, where he receives a recommissioning from God, a huge valley of despair in the middle You see, from his success to his despair, this now leads us to his recommissioning. Because God isn't content to leave Elijah in that valley. God still has work for Elijah to do. And what he's going to eventually show Elijah is that it's not always as spectacular as Mount Carmel. Most of the time, in fact, what God needs Elijah to do is just put one foot in front of the other, go where he tells him, and say what he tells him to say. And that is extraordinary. Getting to serve God in the way that God sees fit, not always in the way that we might draw up if we were drawing out the play. That is extraordinary. You see, there's a handful of lessons that we ought to learn from what God tells Elijah here in 1 Kings 19. Let's get back into the text here. 1 Kings 19, he's finally made it to the cave, not in the whirlwind, not in the earthquake, not in the fire, but in the still small voice. God asks him the same question a second time, wondering if Elijah's going to change his tune. (laughs) What are you doing here, Elijah? Doesn't God know? Doesn't God know? What are you doing here? Well, you told me to come here, God. (laughs) This is exactly the cave you told me to come to, and yet God still asks him, what are you doing here? In other words, what are you looking for? Perhaps we could pose the question for us this morning as Christians who, by the way, gold star, you're here the Sunday after Easter. Way to go. Well done. Round of applause. We could ask the same question, couldn't we? What are we doing here? Why are you here today? God knows. Do you? Of course, here in the cave, now God gives him the answer. Verse 15, and the Lord said to him, go, return on your way to the wilderness of Damascus. And when you arrive, you shall anoint Hazael to be king over Syria. A four-part command we're getting into here in verses 15 through 17 in 1 Kings 19. The first part is go. Now that I've brought you a 40-day journey from Carmel to Horeb, now I'm giving you a task to go somewhere else. In other words, I'm not going to leave you to wallow in the cave. This cave is not where your life comes to an end. I know that's what you prayed for, but that's not what you're going to get. Brothers and sisters, sometimes the thing that we pray for is not the thing that's best for us. Are you with me? And yet God has a different timing. God has a different plan sometimes. Much of the time, that plan involves us actually doing something. Not just hearing what God has to say, but then doing something with it. You see, he realizes for Elijah that the wallowing isn't helping. Notice that God doesn't reprimand Elijah, though. He's not getting on to him for feeling bad, for feeling low, for being scared of Jezebel. We might think that Elijah, one of these great heroes of our faith, he ought to know better than to fear this evil queen. God doesn't rebuke him for that, though. What Elijah felt was natural, it was normal, and it was real. This is one of the reasons why I love actually reading the Bible. We see that these great heroes of our faith felt the same kinds of things that we feel on a daily basis, and they feel them to the same magnitude to which we feel them. Elijah isn't pulling any punches with how he feels toward God. God can handle his criticism. 
And yet God does not leave him to simply continue to criticize for all the rest of the days of his life. Brothers and sisters, God has bigger plans for us than to sit around and feel sorry for ourselves in the name of suffering for the name of Christ. This is what God tells Elijah to do, which is go. Perhaps what he needed was a change of scenery. The the cave may not have been the best place to spend time when he was deeply depressed. You've got to get out of the cave. But the story continues. He tells him, first and foremost, to go. But this is what he tells him to go and do. Continuing in verse 15, Elijah is instructed with something else. Go, return on your way, verse 15, to the wilderness of Damascus, and when you arrive, you shall anoint Hazael to be king over Syria. And Jehu, verse 16, the son of Nimshi, you shall appoint to be king over Israel. And Elisha, the son of Shaphat, of Abel, Mahola, you shall appoint to be prophet in your place. In other words, Elijah, back to work. Anybody ever punched one of these time clocks before? You have no idea how long it took me to find one of these pictures on the internet to put up here on the side. This is not a thing people still do anymore, apparently. It made me feel like the gray hairs were growing in thick when I was thinking, oh, I remember that summer job that I had where as soon as you got out of the car, you ran in and punched that time clock. And then you waited at the very end of the day till the last second before you got back in the car to stamp it again. Every last second of the work mattered. And yet what Elijah is given by God here is a very full to-do list, isn't it? You've got work to do. Appoint Hazael to be king over Syria, Jehu king over Israel, and Elisha. We'll come back to him in a moment. In other words, what God told him was, Elisha, or Elijah, listen, the lesson that you need to learn here is the world doesn't revolve around you. Perhaps one of the most important lessons we can ever learn in life, isn't it? Yeah, a tough one for preachers to learn, Jerry. Yeah, you don't have to amen that one. Yeah, the world doesn't revolve around you. Elisha, back to work. I've got plans for you. There's more to life than this cave and your despair. Elijah, of course, is given a job to do. He's given a mission to accomplish. And thirdly, he's given the aid that he needs to accomplish it. You see, the third part of that anointing that he's commissioned with in verse 16 then includes a helper, a helper named Elisha. He goes to appoint Elisha. Elisha, of course, is going to be a close companion for Elijah. It's not that he's then going to hand off the baton to Elijah. Uh, Elisha handing off the baton to Elisha, and he's clocking out. He's done. You've asked to be done with working for me, God says, and of course, it looks as if on a surface level, that's what it looks like. I'm appointing a successor. He'll take over for you there. But Elisha doesn't take over for Elijah immediately. First, God has them work together. This is critical. Of course, verse 16, he's instructed to go and anoint Elisha, son of Shaphat, of Abel Mahola. You shall anoint to be a prophet in your place. But then... The very next paragraph in the call of Elisha here, uh, he's called by another term, not just a prophet in your place, but verse 21 says that Elisha assisted him. See, God knew that at this point he had done a lot and he had done it alone, and God heard that prayer. Remember Elisha's complaint, Lord, I have, I, 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 I went, I did, I preached, I prophesied, and now I'm the last prophet left. God didn't give him the relief that he asked for, which was a quick death. God instead gave him the answer to the real underlying problem, which was Elijah felt lonely. And so he gave him a friend. Brothers and sisters, you and I were not intended to do Christianity in a vacuum. We were not meant to suffer alone. We were not meant to complete our God-given missions alone. God has given us good company hasn't he? Lifelines, apprentices, and friends. Finally, of course, as uh, God gives Elijah this new commission to go to work to help, finally he's called to trust. Verse 17, he assures him, the one who escapes from the sword of Hazael shall Jehu put to death, and the one who escapes from the sword of Jehu shall Elisha put to death. Yet I will leave 7,000 in Israel, all the knees that have not bowed to Baal, 
and every mouth that has not kissed him. If we were to translate that into pragmatic terms, what we might could say is this. I'm going to give you what you need, Elijah. You need to get back to work. I've got a plan for you. And from there, Elijah, you need to trust that I will make things right. Leave justice, in other words, in my hands. You're upset that Israel is unfaithful. You're upset that there are people who want to kill you. I see that. I know that. And I will make it right in my timing. This is hard for us to often grasp, isn't it? We want things done our way according to our timetables, and yet what God tells Elijah is exactly what Elijah needs to hear, which is, leave it to me. Justice is in my hands, and though it might feel this way, I will not sit idly by. What an amazing story. There's a lot for us to learn from this, isn't there? You see, brothers and sisters like Elijah Many of us are looking for an experience, and sometimes we want worship to feel satisfying. And when we come to worship, we want to experience the presence of God. I I want to feel that. I I admit it. I love it when we sing the song that hits just exactly the right feeling that I'm feeling, and I'm lifting up my prayer to God, and it's as if I can feel God right there with me in worship. There's times when that's the case, absolutely, 100%. Times when I show up to worship and I know that God is with us. There's other times when that is not the case. Sometimes worship means trying to keep the kids from killing one another down in the pew or from spilling everybody's grape juice. Sometimes that's what worship looks like for us as young parents. You see, we're looking for an experience because that's what our culture glorifies. We, we listen to those with experience in our field of interest, but most of us will never be able to see God rain down fire on Mount Carmel. In fact, our experiences on a daily basis may look very routine, very dry, very ordinary, very unglorious. But the question this morning is, what message is there for us who feel stuck and tired and unmotivated? Brothers and sisters, in a culture looking for glorious experiences, We find our greatest experience in the daily decision to be faithful with what God provides. The daily decision to be faithful. See, brothers and sisters, God makes the ordinary time extraordinary, doesn't he? He provides us with his presence. He has given us a sacred calling and a community of support, an extraordinary community of, I hate to break it to you, extremely ordinary folks, because this is God's plan. This is God's design. It's God who makes this extraordinary. You see, the most life-changing experience with God isn't found with the most charismatic speaker, the most talented and vibrant worship leader. You're doing a great job, Jeff. It's sounding great this morning. Uh, it's not with the most well-planned youth rally or even from the top of a mountain. The real experience God offers is, of course, through our daily decision to be faithful and to see that he's there morning after morning after morning. In other words, brothers and sisters, God doesn't call us to be spectacular. He calls us to be faithful. Will you be faithful with the little that God has given you? Isn't this our barometer for success? He who is faithful with little Perhaps it looks like this for you this week. Coworkers and employees are the people that God has put in your life, and you can, of course, serve God by honoring Him through your work with a loving demeanor, a show, words of encouragement to these employees, to these friends, to your coworkers. Be God's ambassador in your workplace. Be God's ambassador in your schools. Teens, be faithful with what you have been given. If for now that means you do your homework and you show up to class on time and you keep for yourself from making that dumb joke in class when you know you shouldn't make it, well, that's what faithfulness looks like in that context. It means you do your schoolwork to the best of your abilities, to the glory of God, and be faithful in doing so. Honor your teachers and your classmates day in and day out. Remember, it's a season that won't last forever. Make Monday, brothers and sisters, a great day of the week. Look forward to it. Perhaps that's just me as a preacher. Preachers love Mondays. Monday's a great day of the week in ministry. Uh, Monday's the day to reset and start over. And what if we all looked at Monday as a blessing? 
a day that many of us dread, is an opportunity to be a blessing, to celebrate God's presence in the normalcy. Remember, of course, that just as God gave Elijah, Elisha as a support, so too has he given us this church family. It's to be a blessing to us and a responsibility for us to be a blessing too. It goes both ways because God knows that we need each other, doesn't he? Elijah needed more than his negative thoughts. He needed more than the angels too. He needed a friend. When you feel down, the woe is me mentality, the Eeyore mentality, we can call it. Remember this, to get up, get to work, find something to do. There's plenty to do around here. Might now be a good time once again to plug. There's a VBS meeting after worship in the wilds. And of course, that the Grace Room is opening this week. And just ask Amy Dotson there and Linda Weaver, there's still a lot of work to be done to get ready for it. I'm sure they could use some help. The Thursday lunch crew is always looking for some new hands to step up and fill in and serve our community. Remember that whatever's got you down, trust that God can handle it. Leave it in his hands and leave it there with prayer. This morning, if you need our support in prayer, this morning, if you need us to to help pick you up from whatever reason you've been down in the dumps, perhaps it's that post-Easter crash or something else altogether, if this morning you need for God to give your life purpose and a fresh start, a new life, With him, just as Elena did, you can be baptized into Christ for the forgiveness of your sins to receive God's presence through the Holy Spirit, to be raised in newness of life. Or perhaps you just need a nudge in the right direction out of the cave. Now's your chance. Let's do it as we stand and sing.